Okay, as everyone continues to stream in, I welcome you again and say hello. My name is Chelsea Lake. I'm a member of the events team at Politics and Prose Bookstore, and welcome to PMP Live. Before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. At any time during the event, you can click on the link that I will be dropping in the chat to purchase Friends from the Beginning. You can ask a question by clicking on the Q&A, which can be found along the bottom of your screen. Uh, make sure that you distinguish between the chat, which will be open, and the Q&A. Both are along the bottom of your screen. We are delighted to offer closed captioning for this event via Zoom's auto captioning service. To access captions, simply click on the live transcript option also along the bottom of your screen. Now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Stacy Johnson Batiste is a national sales channel manager at AT&T. She received her Bachelor of Science degree in organizational behavior from the University of San Francisco and was an honoree featured in CRN magazines, The Power 100, The Most Powerful Women in the Channel in 2018. Friends from the Beginning is a vivid, intimate portrait of the friendship forged between Stacy Johnson Batiste and her childhood best friend, Vice President Kamala Harris, and of the community in which they were raised and the lessons offered by those they loved and admired from childhood through their teenage years and up to the present day. Stacy, I turn the floor or the screen over to you and then I'll be back later to take questions from the audience. Awesome. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you to my friends and family and colleagues that have joined. I think this will be a, um, well, I, I'm very, very excited um, about this session. I'm very excited and thrilled um, about this book and uh, uh, to share it with you. And I see some of my friends are sending messages in the chat. So nice to see you all. So what I plan to do first is spend um, maybe 20 minutes reading um, from a few passages of the book and then uh, have a little discussion, sort of talk through my whole thought process and, um, you know, how all this evolved and then leave plenty enough time for Q&A. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask me anything and just be sure to click the Q&A button versus the chat button. That'd be great. <laughs> so without further ado, I'm going to read a few uh, passages from my book. I want to start with chapter one, the opening chapter, and, which is titled Passion and Purpose. Uh, it, it's a pretty lengthy chapter, so I'm going to skip a little bit into it and then jump around a little bit because I really want to end with this chapter and then leave time to um, read a few chapters into the second chapter, which is called Vibrance. And that has to do with Berkeley, my beloved Berkeley. So <clears throat> I'm starting kind of in uh, the middle of chapter one. January 16th finally arrived. My heart was filled with anticipation as my son drove me to the airport for the spe specially chartered flight which would depart LAX and make a stop in Oakland to pick up other friends and family of Kamala, soon to be, <clears throat> excuse me, soon to be Madam Vice President, then off to DC. Once at the airport, I eagerly boarded the plane and found my seat. Welcome aboard the inaugural express, read the seat placeholders with our respective names written beneath. Shortly after I took my seat, an announcement came <clears throat> from the cockpit, cockpit, letting us know that an all-female flight crew had been requested by the vice president-elect. I had never flown on a plane in which the captain, first officer, and entire crew were exclusively women. I laughed out loud with delight and settled in, knowing this was one of the many firsts I'd experience and witness over the next few days. A small group of us were departing from Los, from Los Angeles, including a few members of the PIC committee, that's the Presidential Inauguration Committee, Kamala's best friend, Chrisette, and her family, which includes Kamala's god, 
children. Doug's son, Cole, Kamala's beloved stepson, and also Cole's mom, Kirsten, who has a legitimately wonderful relationship with Kamala. I smiled at everybody, but tried to maintain a relaxed demeanor. Though I'm sure anyone looked Anyone who looked at my eyes would have been able to see that I was practically bursting with excitement. I couldn't wait to find out whom we'd be picking up in Oakland. Patrick had kept asking if I had called Derek Johnson, a good friend from childhood, to see if he was going. Derek and I had attended St. Jo Joseph's Catholic Elementary School together and have remained friends over, ever since first grade. Derek and Kamala met during our senior year of high school when she moved back home from Montreal. They hit it off immediately as, as she did with almost all of my friends. The two of them had maintained a close, close separate friendship and he had always been there to support her throughout her campaigns. I was sure he would be on the plane, but I didn't want to be the person calling him in the unlikely but awkward event that he wasn't going. I figured he hadn't been in touch for the same reason. After the short flight up from LA, we touched down to pick up the Bay Area crew. And sure enough, Derek boarded the plane along with a handful of other longtime family friends with whom Kamala and I had grown up. It was a good thing I had my seatbelt on as my instinct was to run to the front of the plane to greet them. Unfortunately, due to the COVID guidelines that had been laid out so very clear, I wasn't able to do that. So I, so I refrained and instead stayed towards the back half of the plane in the designated SoCal section, waving enthusiastically at each person who boarded. Once everyone from Oakland was on the plane, I couldn't help myself. I eased my way towards the front of front to at least say a quick, enthusiastic, relatively distant hi to Sharon Shelton McGaffey and Judy Shelton Robinson, daughters of Mrs. Regina. Regina Shelton, a crucial pillar of my and Kamala's upbringing. I agreed to Kamala's longtime friend, Gloria Rhines, a former judge I had gotten to know at Kamala and Doug's wedding. I was thrilled to see Cynthia Bagby and other family members of her uncle, Audrey, Aubrey Labrie, yet another important uh, family figure um, from our childhood, childhood. Each deeply recognizable face turned up my emotional excitement that much more. It felt like a mini reunion with people and families I've known for as far back as my memory goes. <clears throat> that night, the eve of the inauguration, I was so excited. I didn't think I was going to be able to sleep. I couldn't even lie down. So I laid everything out for the next day. Brown tweed suit, black turtleneck, tights, hand warmers, black velvet gloves, black faux earmuffs. I wanted to look professional while also being sure I was warm enough to enjoy the whole day. The next morning, we completed our COVID test by 8 a.m., and met in a specified ballroom on the lobby, lobby level by 8.30 a.m. for metal detector screening. As I glanced around at Kamala's chosen family congregated in that ballroom, even though we had masks, masks on, I could see that everyone's eyes were shining, full of vibrant anticipation. Colleagues of mine back in California had expressed genuine concern about my going, given the terrifying insurrection that occurred just two weeks prior. I appreciated why they would be worried, but told them that there was no way I was not going to be there for Kamala. I could sense that everybody, that everybody in that room felt precise, precisely the same way. The energy was one of positivity, pride, and overwhelming excitement. I kept surveying the crew, marveling at how many of them I've known since Kamala and I were little girls. Of course, her beloved sister, Maya, along with her husband, and their daughter, Mina, and her husband, and their two adorable daughters, Derek, Judy, and Sharon, Cynthia, and other members of the Labrie family. These were connections nearly half a century old. It was such a profound testament to Kamala's loyalty and to the value she places on friendship that most of us had known her for decades. We had each been with Kamala at various moments in her journey to this day. We were visibly proud to be there supporting her. 
Nothing and no one could put a damper on such enthusiasm and loyalty. Not the fear of COVID, not the shocking violence that had taken place in the Capitol, nothing. In that moment and in many that were soon to come, I felt infused with awe to have such a profound connection with her and our hometown community. A staffer came and announced that it was time to proceed to the shuttle buses. That was the first time I had been outside in the daylight since our arrival. It had been dark when we landed, landed, so I hadn't taken in much of the surroundings. Now, by daylight, I saw soldiers lined up along the sidewalk with all of the intersections blocked by police. We followed our pick chaperones to our assigned shuttle buses a few blocks away. As we walked briskly down Connecticut Avenue, I couldn't get over the police and military presence. I had been expecting a high level of security and an, and an abundance of caution, but it was still alarming to see so many men and women in uniform, armed and standing guard. I boarded the bus, sat next to a window and continued scanning the area. It looked as if all of DC was shut down and had been taken over by police. Looking up, I caught a glimpse of the mayor of Atlanta, Keisha Lance Bottoms, walking alongside my bus. Surrounded by security escorts, we made our way to the Capitol building. building. Given, the, given the excessive military presence all around, the atmosphere looked like a scene from a war movie or an alien invasion. We were led off in front of the Capitol, then escorted along a path that led to the west side of the building, facing the reflecting pool and the Washington Monument. As we made our way to our seated area, I saw Mayor Bottoms again with her husband. I'm a huge fan and I ended up walking beside her. Though it isn't something I would normally do, I said hello and timidly asked if she wouldn't mind taking a selfie with me. <laughs> she was just as gracious as I had imagined and her eyes smiled in agreement. I took our picture, told her how much I admired her, her work and thanked her for everything she is doing for my daughter and her family who live in Atlanta. When we arrived, arrived at our designated area, De Derek and I sat next to each other in the vicinity of a few, of a few other, others from Kamala's group. Everyone was visibly buzzing with excitement and energy as, as I was. The, the profound significance of the event officially settled in a far more real way than I had felt upon opening the invitation. My longtime dear friend was about to be sworn in as the first Black first Indian, first female vice president of the United States. Though trying to maintain a sense of formality, I stood up to take a few pictures, trying to capture the moment and all the emotions surging through me. As members of the Senate arrived, the surreal nature of the experience overwhelmed me. And I sat down just to take it all in. I couldn't believe I was there. It was almost too much. Well, you guys know I'm very emotional. <laughs> Sitting in my hotel room, I poured a glass of Cabernet and laid out what I was going to wear for the evening's festivities. As I was reflecting on the epic day and everything I had just witnessed, my memory sent me back to early December, 2019. After a Thanksgiving holiday spent taking stock of the road ahead, Kamala had come to the painful realization that she did not see a path to winning the presidential nomination. I spoke with her on the phone and she told me what she had openly shared with the American public, that leaving the race was the hardest thing she'd ever, she ever had to do. She had given so much and she knew how much others had given as well. We spoke briefly about the remaining candidates and she mentioned her respect for Biden. Everything was so uncertain. I could hear the strain in her voice and sensed her exhaustion. But I watched coverage shortly after that showed how Kamala had chosen to handle withdrawing from the race after a grueling year campaign, campaigning on the road. She didn't get on TV and start blaming other people or other parties or bemoaning the system. She gathered her staff together at her, at, at her headquarters in Baltimore, blasted Beyonce's <laughs> 
rendition of Before I Let Go and joined her crew of joyful warriors who had worked so hard on her behalf in a cathartic parting dance of the electric slide. <laughs> That's how she left the race, by bringing people together and finding the strength to lift them up despite extreme disappointment. Such a significant decision is usually announced along with images of defeated campaign workers slowly emptying out of the room, leaving behind signs and buttons and whiteboard strategies that will soon be erased. That's not Kamala's style. The first time she took the bar exam in 1989, she didn't pass. That wasn't going to deter her. She wanted to become a lawyer. So she was going to be a lawyer. She studied for another year, kept her sights set on, on that goal, and, and passed it the following year. So it was in keeping with her nature that when she left the presidential race, she danced her way out with grace and gratitude. Pause for a beat, promised to keep on fighting, then got by, right back up and returned to the game. That's resilience, that's grit, and that's exactly what I've come to expect from her. I smiled, took another sip of wine, and finished getting ready. It was time to go celebrate. At 7.30 p.m., we all met downstairs for security sweeps, uh, sweeps before head, uh, uh, being driven to the Lincoln Memorial. The ambiance both bre breathtaking and somber as, as spotlights illuminated the memorial and the figure of President Lincoln, looking out at 400 candles framing the reflecting pool, each representing a thousand American, a thousand American lives lost to the devastating pandemic. I had seen it on television as I was getting ready, but to stand there gazing at the poignant tribute in person in all its dimensions was far more heart-wrenching than I would have imagined. We paused before it in silence, all perched to the right of our new Vice President Harris, as she rose before the glorious grave scene to deliver her inaugural speech in this historic new position. She looked every bit the class act, the class act she is in an elegant black sequin dress with black leather pointed toe pumps, a style she has worn ever since we were old enough to wobble our way into wearing high heels. Her speech spoke to American aspiration. She referenced Abraham, Abraham Lincoln, Dr. King, the women of our nation, and the authors of the Bill of Rights, while also recognizing parents, educators, and those nurturing their communities. She delivered authentic po authenticity, poise, and unwavering optimism, saying, even in dark times, we are not only, we not only dream, we do. We not only see what has been, what has been, we see what can be. In such words and in her voice, I heard the self-confident drive she has long possessed made that much more poignant because she was offering that confidence to, to, to America by the very act of standing as our new vice president. This gave credence to her message that dreaming big and working hard can yield success. Her, her message was direct and relatable. She believes in our country and believes in what we will be able to accomplish together. Afterward, we proceeded to the steps of the Lincoln Memorial to enjoy fireworks. The Kamala crew stood behind her and Doug on the stairs leading up to the Lincoln Memorial. I was so emotional standing amid this village, this web of connections, watching our childhood friend make history right in front of me. All our profiles were alight and smiling, our eyes raised to behold the show. When the display was finished and the crowd had thinned out, we all gathered inside the Lincoln Memorial area to take a few group, group photos and chat together. That we kept a reasonable distance from each other, it felt so heartening to just reconnect with people after nearly a year of lockdowns and isolation. All too soon, we were told it was time to break up our little party. As Kamala turned to leave, I made my way to her. Congratulations, Kamala. She reached out and squeezed my hand. Thank you, Stacy. We locked smiling eyes and held that glance for a few precious seconds capping off one of the most meaningful days of my life.
The more I thought about the characteristics I admire most in my friend, whom I had just seen make history, the more I realized that they were the same ones I had dr that had drawn me to her throughout our child childhood and sustained our friendship from the beginning. Inspired, I pulled out my journal and began writing our qualities, writing out the qualities that had defined the past few days for me. Throughout the inauguration, two words had kept echoing through my mind, passion and purpose. But there were other qualities I had seen in Kamala, ones that she has possessed throughout the long, long arc of our friendship. Growing up in Berkeley at the precise moment when we did, raised by mothers who exemplified grit and ambition, surrounded by sage, supportive, and selfless net, and the selfless network of brilliant minds, that place and those influences remain present in her. Having shared so many of the same places and personalities throughout our childhood, we forged a pure early bond one that gave each of us the, the gift of a friend for life. Kamala has always been one to follow her dreams and fight like hell to achieve her goals. Regardless of what she's reaching towards, I trust she knows she will always be supported from the ground up by all of us who forged those early bonds. Playing together as children in the backyard at Mrs. Shelton's, whose daughters and Bible were sitting a few rows ahead of me on the plane. Kamala has never lost her sense of joy, in the, even in the face of great sorrow or disappointment. She's harnessed, harnessed her innate capacity to put things in perspective, let go, laugh, and dance <laughs> the electric slide and move forward. On the flip side, because she's known hardship herself, her loyalty, empathy, and compassion always comes through when she sees a friend or a country for that matter, that's, that's in need. I've seen all those qualities on display from the playgrounds of our youth to the pomp and parade down Pennsylvania Avenue. The pilot got on the loudspeaker again, interrupting my thoughts to let us know we would soon be making our first stop. I looked out the window for a while, the instinctive smile I began to make out of the bright landmarks that have always signaled that I'm almost home. The distinct, unmistakable peaks of the Mormon temple in Oakland, the sprawling UC Berkeley campus, its stately soaring Campanile Tower. I, I prepared myself to, to, to say goodbye to the Oakland crew, feeling a bit of nostalgia because I wouldn't be deplaning with them. Once again, we had touched, touched down and taxied. I exchanged big real hugs with D Derek and the Shelton daughters. With, with much of the playing having, having emptied out, I returned to my seat and gazed back out of my small window. Lifting off, I watched the lights of the city until I could no longer decipher its notable landmarks. The qualities I had traced out on the page in front of me were indeed threads wrote, woven throughout both Kamala's and my childhood and my inauguration experience. This book looks back to the people who were essential to nurturing those characteristics. My intent is to honor the original influences Kamala and I shared, explore the places and personalities that have proven so foundational to who we are today, and give tribute, tribute to our ongoing friendship with his, which has lasted pra practically our entire lives. <clears throat> to achieve this retrospective roadmap, I've begun with a common background on which we first connected growing up in Berkeley. And before I lead into that, and I'm only gonna read a couple of pages into Vibrance, which is about Berkeley and Berkwood. I, I wanted to talk about something that was very remarkable, which was um, the fact that um, the flight going, leaving California to DC, DC and on the return flight, um, Kamala had requested an all female flight crew. So the pilot, the uh, first officer and all of the crew were women and it was just um, remarkable. And on the return flight, um, the pilot went on the overhead and said that um, she and her first officer had a combined um, 45 years of experience and not never had they ever been asked to do something 
so significant. So that was um, really, really special. <clears throat> okay, so I'm just gonna read two pages in Vibrance and that's the second chapter and then we can open it up for questions. Our hometown of Berkeley, California sits along the east shore of San Francisco Bay just across from the Golden Gate Bridge. For, for most of the world, its, its name alone conjures up the activism and unrest of the 1960s and 1970s and the free speech movement that ignited there. Few, few cities are so in, intrinsically linked to an era and its politics. More than half a century later, people continue to associate Berkeley with that heady time of cultural expression and diversity. All forms of activism, new trends in music and food, and an overwhelming resistance to the status quo. Much of this reputation was born and fostered around the city's branch of, branch of the University of California, the world-renowned college familiarly known as Cal. Cal served as a natural hub, but for the fight, but the fight for justice, whether one's focus was racial, racial equality, the women's movement, nuclear disarmament, or just hazy requests for peace, quickly spread beyond the campus's borders and into neighboring Oakland and San Francisco, helping cement the Bay Area's reputa reputation as a destination for idealists and radicals of every variety. I was born, into, born directly into this energy in 1964. Right around the time, time when this reputation was Ber for Berkeley was gaining traction, shortly before more aggressive protests about Vietnam were, were launched and the Black Panthers were, were formed. Just as the small city was garnering attention as a national, even global hotspot for the encouragement and inevitable pushback against free, express free expression. Though I couldn't, couldn't have known it, some of the largest demonstrations opposing the war and, and for freedom of expression took, took place when I was less than one year old. I'm not a historian, but many others has, have cited the fall of 1964 as the most dramatic and notable turning point for Berkeley. From that point on, students and younger freedom fighters flocked to the city to be heard and seen, being raised amid an influx of voices and movements mean growing up there a unique, vibrant experience. Though for me, with no basis for comparison, the environment and community were just home. So I just wanna say if just a few little words before we go into the questions. Um, one, writing this book was, um, was so, um, it, 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 I, it, I can't even find the, the words for it. I am so grateful to have had my mother and her memory to help me write this. Um, she's always been able to tell <laughs> such amazing, wonderful stories. And these are real life, life stories, nothing made up in such a colorful way. Um, I was also very, very blessed to have an amazing, brilliant collaborator. I have to give her credit. Dominica Alioto, you are fabulous. She was able to take my words and arrange them in, in such a beautiful way. Um, and the, the genesis for all this really started with um, just a white piece of paper and me making some bullet notes and then a whole bunch of yellow sticky notes in order for me to prepare for media interviews that I was asked to do um, about Kamala when Biden had selected her, her as his running mate. And the more I started taking notes, the more I started to remember and, and think back to our childhood and all of these little thoughts and memories just started flooding back. And my good friend, who's like a brother to me, Oscar Jackson Jr., um, also known as um, the rapper Paris, had encouraged me to write and he suggested that I keep a journal with me at all times. And I started doing that. And the real inspiration I'd say came the night of the inauguration. It was just very, very moving uh, to me. 
um, you know, the, the image of all that. And I just thought it was so profound that of all the people I know, um, Vice President Harris, my friend Kamala knows, she chose her longest and just her close friends and family to be alongside her. And I just thought that said so much about, you know, her as a person, her, her loyalty, her, her um, character. And on the plane ride back, I just could not stop writing in that journal. And so that's, that's how it all came about. So Chelsea, do we have any questions? Well, I think we can fit um, more. So I want to encourage everybody to um, pop open the Q&A and ask your questions. We have only four right now, and we've got, we've got another 30 minutes. So wonderful opportunity to ask this lovely author about all of her experiences um, in such a wonderful subject. So I'll just start from the, from the top. Okay. And uh, we'll go from there. And I did notice somebody uh, raised their hand. We're, we, we don't have the ability to call on you in that way. If you can't find the Q&A, just pop it in the chat and I'll, I'll look there uh, to ask your question. Okay, first uh, from Anonymous, what does the VP think of your book? So let me first say that um... I, I wanted to be very, very transparent from the very beginning. Um, and I made a point of, uh, well, I did talk to Kamala. So the last time she had her um, personal cell phone, um, we had a chance to talk. This was in November of 2020. And at that time, I just had a rough, rough sketch, like maybe three pages written out and just kind of these ideas. And I did share that with her and I left a very lengthy voicemail message and I said, please, 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 before you give up your phone, listen to my message. So I did try my best to outline, you know, what it was about. And she, you know, was supportive um, at that time. But again, I didn't have much formulated then. Once I had a kind of a rough manuscript, I did um, talk to her sister, Maya. And we talked several times at length. Uh, because again, I wanted somebody close to her, whether it's you know her, her sister or Doug or someone from the staff to be able to at least communicate you know what I have going um, and 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 so on. But they're the neither the vice president nor the president are supposed to endorse or kind of like uh, um, approve these types of things. And I totally get that. But I have been in communication with her um, chief of staff who um, has read it and I know she's with her all the time. So I, I, um, I think that once she has a chance to read it at some point, I, I'm hopeful that, that, that she'll be you know, pleased and touched. So, and really know that I was coming you know, from the heart. Okay, great. Uh, this from also from anonymous attendee, how does she handle criticism? And I might add in, the, in particular, the criticism that's always levied at female politicians, you know, just some of the criticism of her um, laugh, for example, is just so cringeworthy. What, what's your experience um, with her in that regard? Well, I don't think ever laugh is being cringeworthy. <laughs> no, um, no, I meant the criticism oh. <laughs> of her laugh is crit. You know that they would they would pick on that. Not no, I apologize. That didn't yes, come yeah. right. Sure, sure. Um, so uh, first, how she handles criticism. Um, I, I mean, she has been she's been in in male dominated roles and the first woman and black woman, um, woman of color elected to many um, positions. So she's used to it. She has thick, thick skin, she's, she's tough. What I know about her though, is that um, she's gonna focus on the work that needs to be done. And, um, you know, kind of put aside a lot of the banter and chatter and just really focus on on the work and what she was elected to do um, you know and and that's what I I know about her um, 
And yeah, so I, I, I don't know that she knows a lot of the hearsay. I mean, I hope that some of that, that chatter is kind of kept to the side so they can, you know, keep to the mission at, at hand. Um, and being a woman, I think that, you know, um, it's, it's always tough, especially in your, when you're in a male dominated field, the eyes are going to be all on her. And actually just this week, I was asked maybe four, three or four times, um, you know, what's the vice president doing? And how do you think the vice president is doing, you you know, with their um, role? And I, I don't remember people really wondering what Vice President Cheney or Gore or um, Pants for that matter, or even uh, Vice President Biden, what they were doing, you know, um, we just kind of assumed them that that they were doing whatever the vice presidents do. So I would imagine she's just um, presiding over the Senate and um, moving forward with initiatives, one of which is very near and dear to my, my heart, which is the broadband initiative. Um, and, uh, you know, just, just doing what, doing the good work that I know she's always done. Yeah. I I brought up the laugh only because, you know, women get a different kind of criticism, you know, about their hair, the way they do their hair, what the, the clothes they wear that men don't get. And that was when I remember from campaigning. Okay. Moving along. Uh, uh, the third question is, is what have you learned from her as a leader? And you touched on this a little bit, but do you, is there anything you would like to add? That's a really good question. So we've had completely different career paths. My path is in telecommunications. And when we would get together for dinner, you know, when I worked in the city, when she and I both worked in the city, or even back when we both worked in Oakland, um, we wouldn't really talk about our our work, our jobs. I would try and tell her a little bit about my data and networking and so on. And, and she's like, okay. <laughs> and, you know, so we, um, our, our relationship is our friendship. But what I have learned from her is um, I admire the fact that she's a good listener. Um, and for me, she's always listened to me as if everything I have to say is interesting and important. And I, I, I try to listen more and talk less, um, especially the older I get. I, I really find that I can't coach or mentor or um, lead unless I first listen and really understand my, you know, uh, uh, the people and the issues and our clients and things like that. So I, um, I admire a lot of things, one of which is her ability to listen to people and to connect with people. Um, and she's always down to earth. So back to that laugh, that's authentic. That is her. <laughs> and that's her mother. And I love the fact that she's, um, down to earth and she's going to continue being, um, you know, the complete person she is. She's always struck me as someone authentic, that what you see is what you get. It's not an air. It's not something that she feels she has to do. This is the real her. Definitely. I'm glad to hear that. Okay. Janice Paulson has asked, what is the most important part of your friendship with the VP in your mind? Hmm. This important part. Well, uh, let me think here. If I, okay. If I imagine if, if I had just like one hour, you know, with her right now, what I would do is just, we'd hold hands. That's what we always do. We grab each other's hands. Now with COVID, that's a little bit different. We give each other a long hug and we just talk about what's going on with each other. Uh, we enjoy flipping through old photos. Um, we enjoy, like our mothers, a good hearty laugh. Um, so our friendship, I think, is is uh, just rooted in just this long history of being connected and all these people that are so special to us that have been in our, our lives. Um, 
you know, the values of family and friendship and integrity. And um, it's it just, we, we've just come from the same clock. So being around each other is just, it's so familiar. No matter how much time goes by, it could be a week or two or month or year. And when we do see each other or talk to each other, it's as if it was yesterday, we immediately pick back up. Um, and it's just that knowing, that trusting that the other is, is still the same. I love that, okay. Rob Foskett, what an accomplishment, Stacy! So proud of you. Not unlike Kamala, you two are such a strong. You two are such a strong woman. What do you most attribute to having this strength? Hmm. Well, I want to first uh, acknowledge my mother. I keep going back to our mothers, and that chapter I wrote is entitled "Grit." Um, because our mothers, uh, I can you know say that my mother taught me how to how to be a good mother, how to persevere, how to never give up. One of the things that <laughs> that she and I always say is, "Where there's a will, there's a way." <laughs> um, so, I mean, I've watched my mom uh, achieve all of her goals. I uh, get my technical analytical skill and knowledge from her. I get my, my artistic and sewing ability from, from her. I, um, I mean, she's just been a role model. And I think, you know, having gone, I mean, life hasn't been easy. It hasn't been easy for, it's not easy for anyone. And I think, you know, those uh, challenges that we face um, help to mold us. We learn and do better and strive to be better and, and so on and so forth. So, I, I mean, I have a lot of great examples. My girlfriends, my close girlfriends, my sisters, they mean everything to me. And, um, you know, so... I mean, I, I, my boss, Harvey, he's just an amazing mentor and leader. I, I've just been fortunate to be around and to work with some phenomenal, um, you know, uh, very, very inspiring people my entire career. So all of that, it's, it's, it's just all of that. And I think it's um, embracing, um, I, I, there was um, one of our, our uh, clients had once said, you know, you, you treat your failures the same as your wins or something to that effect. But anyway, um, the point being is that, you, you know, it's, it's, it's all about the process. And if you, you know, you're going to lose some, you're going to fall, you get right back up, you learn and you keep, you keep on moving. And I've seen um, a lot of examples of that. Okay. Thank you for that. Andrea Miller. What are some of your strengths and weaknesses that you could say you and our VP share, if any? And she signed it, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> That's my cousin. Um, oh boy. Um, these are some tough questions. <laughs> um, geez, uh, the strengths, I want to go back and let me just kind of parallel what I outlined in my book. Um, we grew up around a culture of vibrant, grit, wisdom, inclusivity, um, compassion, um, you know, um, presence, you know, so all of, of those characteristics, I think, have been in our, in our DNA, and we grew up around that. Um, in terms of weaknesses, I know we are both very, um, you know, we, we can be very sensitive. I, I, it doesn't take much, as you can see, um, you know, very, very caring and, and sometimes a little too caring about things. Um, I, 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 I am not perfect by any stretch of the means, but again, every day I get up, I'm grateful. Every day I can walk and move, I am grateful. So, um, 
all I can say is, you know, um, when I make mistakes, if I blurt out something I shouldn't have said, I, uh, you know, just try and do better next time. And um, I think that's, that's all we can all, you know, any of us can do is to just learn and try to be better. Okay. Michael Howard, how does the process of writing collaboratively work and would you recommend it for other aspiring writers? Sure. Well, this was my first, um, my, my first time, you know, writing um, a book and I was so fortunate to have someone who, um, you know, she's from San Francisco. Her father was the former mayor of San Francisco. She, so she brought this experience and this insight um, with her. She's extremely, um, she was very um, insightful and very intuitive. So it made it easy to, um, you know, to, to kind of sh uh, share ideas and um, what worked well in, for me in this process was basically getting everything on paper. And I've always enjoyed writing. Um, <clears throat> not all of, of what I end up writing fit into the book and that was fine. But I really tried to just get it, everything that was remotely connected in any kind of way down on paper. And then we just sort of, you know, kind of mix it all together. And um, I, 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 but in, so in terms of recommending, I would say, yes, sure, absolutely. Um, but the key I think is to have someone that, um, that you can, you know, bounce ideas off that can really kind of feel you and read you and um, has a little bit of background or knowledge about the subject matter. Um, <laughs> I think that that certainly helps. <laughs> Bonus. <laughs> yeah. And then first have a concept yourself of where you want to go with this, what your intent really is, where you're coming from, you know, where your heart and mind is at. And then I think it, things will flow. That's some great advice. Paula Whitehead asks, as you reflect on your journey, how will you articulate your experience to your grandchildren in developing friendships, especially among girls and mm. women? Awesome question. Well, that's one of the things that I'm, I, I'm, I'm also hoping from this book. So my themes really were around sisterhood, lifelong friendships, um, strong women, community engagement, um, and educating a little bit about Berkeley for those who may have forgotten or who don't know, um, and, 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 and so on. And I, I think sisterhood <clears throat> is something that is um, not celebrated enough. And I don't ever wanna take for granted my close friends um, <clears throat> because particularly, particularly I think with black women, we carry so much, we have to be on all the time. I remember <laughs> my son telling me, mom, why don't you just relax? And I'm like, okay, I can't really relax. I have to, there's so much I have to do. You know, we are um, carrying so much on our shoulders and uh, you know, whatever vocation, whatever, uh, you know, career path, um, it, it, it's like we have to really do three and four times as much or as good to be considered even, you know, half as good or taken seriously and really heard. Um, so I think, um, you know, being a good friend it's it's definitely a two-way thing. Some friends, you know, like, some are there to listen, some are there to, you know, um, give advice. I mean, we, we play different roles at different times, but I think when you have a true friend that is down for you, um, it, it, it is golden and should be cherished. Absolutely. Okay, uh, Anonymous asks, do you plan to write more books in the future? There's one in particular that I do want to write, <laughs> and I actually started writing this maybe three or four years ago. Um, it has to do with my beloved dogs. Um, so after this whole process, and I, I did write it. It's a very rough, um, you know, um, but it's completed. So I do want to get that one done. 
that's something that I want to do to memorialize my wonderful, beautiful dogs. So yeah. <laughs> Got more in you. Okay, good deal. We look forward to doing another event in the future. Okay, Tara or Tara Purcell? Tara. 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 Okay. Stacy, you are an inspiration to me. I am so grateful for your mentorship, leadership, compassion for serving, and friendship. Can you share what is your best memory of your and Kamala's childhood? Any special moments that have resonated through your journey in life that may help others to lead with tenacity, with brilliance? Mm. Wow, there's so many memories. <clears throat> So many memories. I, I mean, and they're little, like when we we're little, 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 they're like little flashes, you know. I remember how we used to run up and down the stairs on Bancroft, um, going from Shamla's apartment, which was above the Shelton's nursery. We'd run up and down the stairs. We'd run to the learning center where my brother was at, as well as Maya, because they're um, Maya's, Maya, Kamala's sister is three years younger than us. And my brother, my only sibling is seven years younger than me. I remember going, you know, being that young and running to the, uh, running literally to the learning center, which is like a block away. And when the little kids would wake up um, from their nap, we would help distribute little juice and snack, you know, to them um, going outside, playing on the swings. Uh, we were just really active. I remember um, my fondest memories, my more vivid ones are of our teenage years. We both loved to dance and play records. So we would um, be in my room um, playing records. And when I got my own phone, we would, you know, be on the phone. <laughs> um, so we, you know, would drive around in my mom's forest green, 60, 1966 Mustang all around Berkeley. Uh, we enjoyed uh, meeting up with my other friends from my school. So Kamala and I didn't go to the same school. Um, I mean, we went to the same kindergarten, but then after that, I went to Catholic school from first grade through 12th grade. And she went to public school in Berkeley until they moved to Montreal. Anyway, when we would get together though, she would naturally fit in with my friends. So sometimes we would meet up either find ourselves walking all the way up to Telegraph Avenue from Sacramento Street. And Sacra I mean, um, Telegraph back then um, was lined with street vendors. I mean, tons of vendors. I made everything from handmade jewelry to, um, you know, tie-dyed shirts. And we would go there to get our big pin-on button, some with the peace signs, some with the, hat, the smiley face. And you know, whatever. So I uh, get a large slice of Blondie's pizza. So it was just things like that. Um, and then as we got in our, our 20s, we would like to, you know, go out to dinner. There was one place that we really liked to go to in Berkeley on Shattuck uh, called the Basan Lounge. It was an Indian restaurant up top. Wonderful, wonderful Indian food. And then downstairs after hours, it would turn into kind of like a nightclub, like a dancing club. So our thing was we would get there and eat before they start charging at the door <laughs> and we would hang out. So all we had to do was just go down, down uh, stairs. So anyway, just, you know, memories like that. And when we uh, both bought uh, condominiums in the same building in Oakland on Lakeside Drive, those were wonderful times. I, I titled that chapter Joy. Um, it, it was, she was just an elevator ride away. You know, I would go down with my glass of wine. We'd hang out and chat after work. Um, it's, yeah. I grew up around Berkeley and I remember Blondie's Pizza and the little arcade, I can't remember the name of it, but we used to get a slice of pizza and then go um, to the arcade back when you still played like Pac-Man and Miss Pac-Man. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, Harvey Livingston. Congrats, Stacy, and your AT&T family is so proud of you. We always have been. My question is, given so many consider Berkeley to be the capital of anti-establishment, what key lessons did you and Kamala learn growing up there that has allowed you both to excel within the so-called establishment 
as well as being able to connect to all citizens. Mm. No surprise, my boss would have <laughs> um, a, a, a very uh, thoughtful question. I mean, all, all the questions have, have been thoughtful and I appreciate them all. I think growing up in such a diverse community, it gave us the foundation to relate and appreciate all people, all um, cultures. Um, you know, we were around a variety of, you know, different music and, and, and so on. Um, I, I mean, I have images of the Hare Krishna marching up and down University and Shattuck Avenue and um, just a lot of, of uh, different ideas and the people that we um, grew up around are Aunt Mary, Uncle Sherman, my father, my mom, Shamala, um, and others, um, as well as the Sheltons were very, very smart people, very um, uh, you know, thoughtful in, 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 and uh, uh, my father, as well as Uncle Sherman were both street smart and book smart. So they were very, um, very wise. And these folks really uh, challenged us to, to think, to think about our actions um, and to really try to do our best and to be our best and, um, you know, to accept people, you know, all people and, and to see different points of view. Not everyone is going to agree with you or have the same, you know, um, point of view. And that's where I think the listening and um, listening to understand comes in. So, I mean, it, it, it provided such a, 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 a broad scope, even though Berkeley, you know, it's a really small place, but it was large in terms of, of thought and experience and, um, you know, culture and just all of that. Okay. We have just about two minutes and I'm, so I'm going to combine these last two questions because they deal with a leadership and you've touched on that a little bit. So the first one is from Astrid Ferguson. Yes. Stacy, it has been an inspiration working and learning from you. How does your leadership style parallel with VP, VP Kamala Harris? The second one uh, from Vanessa McConaughey. Stacy, I'm so very proud of you. What do you feel are the most important attributes of Kamala as VP? And then we'll end on those two. Okay. Um, wait, can you repeat the first question from Ashley? Yes. Uh, how does your leadership style parallel with the VPs? Right. Okay. I mean, I'm not... I don't have privy, especially now, to all the inside goings on, you know, of course. But what I do know about her is um, she's going to focus on, on um, making good on the promises to the people. She's going to focus on things that help, um, you know, uh, um, people that are and this is a very complicated answer. I'm trying to make it simple. Um, in 2020, so much got revealed. So much became apparent um, that may not have been apparent in terms of the disparities with healthcare, um, education, um, economics, uh, you know, you name it. And the just racism and um, you know, so many other disparities um, that I know she's going to focus on trying to shore some of those up. Um, it's a huge undertaking. Um, and I would imagine they have to first, you know, the first business at hand was to get the pandemic, get COVID under control. And, um, you know, that, that, that was a challenge for them, I would imagine, coming in and uh, at a time when half, the, you know, half of, of, of um, Americans didn't uh, <laughs> want to wear a mask and didn't believe it. So, um, you know, so, so it, that, I, anyway, um, uh, I, so her leadership style that I know um, of her is that she's going to 
put the right people in place. She's going to really try and get underneath and learn you know, what's at the core root of some of these major issues and try and put things in place to try and shore them up. I, I know that for a fact, and I know that that's something that she would be passionate about, is trying to shore up the gap, even with the digital divide, which again is very um, near and dear to what I do every single day. Um, she's leading the broadband initiative. So, which, you know, that is, <laughs> there's a lot to all that too, but bottom line is urban children, um, rural children and people, every business needs to be connected and in order to just survive. And, you know, uh, um, students, uh, it's, it's so critically important. Long answer. Um, and the second question was again. <laughs> uh, what do you, you, you've touched on it. What do you okay. feel are the most important attributes of the VP? Right. Okay. I would say her ability to, to problem solve. Um, if people want to really know what she's capable of and just some of her grassroots um, ability to get, in, get underneath the problem and to fix it, I still like her very first book, um, um, Back on Track, because, well, number one, I was around her almost every day then, and I could see what was going on on the local news or, you know, she would tell me he would just work on, you know, this case, blah, blah, blah. And I could see the outcome, um, you know, um, on the local news. And we could actually see a lot of what was put in place. So I just go back to what I know she's done and what she's capable of doing and her track record of doing what she says she's gonna do and getting things done, problem solving. What a nice note to end on. And I'm sorry that the hour has gone by so quickly and I'm sorry we don't have more time. I could go on listening to you for another hour, but alas, it is now 6.03. So as a gentle reminder to um, everybody out in our audience, I've put uh, the book link to uh, purchase Friends from the Beginning. Excuse me, it'll take you to the Politics and Prose website where you, after you purchase the book, you can check out our events page. We'd love to see you at another event soon. <coughs> Excuse me. I just want to read one um, comment in the chat. It's from Lauren Smith, who says, I couldn't be more proud of you, mom. And so on that, I'll say thank you, Stacy. I uh, really enjoyed it. And um, thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you for having me, Chelsea. Of course. Take care.